Well, good morning. You can join me in opening your Bibles to Luke, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11. So we're wrapping up a short series that we do at the turn of every year called Rhythms of Renewal. And so our focus is on how God transforms us through various practices or habits or rhythms. And so last week we focused on hearing God's Word through preaching, and this morning focuses on how we can pray together. So we want to be a praying church. And this does not necessarily mean that we have to add a number of prayer services or prayer meetings for the whole church. Being a praying church doesn't necessarily mean we add prayer alongside a list of everything else we do. It means that we do everything by prayer. We incorporate and integrate prayer into everything we do. So we pray in our Sunday gathering, we pray in our small groups, we pray in our families and in friendships and personally for one another. We do everything by prayer. So Luke chapter 11, and by the way, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one under the seats nearby. And this is on page 869 in those Bibles. Now, when you hear the word, the topic of prayer this morning, uh, I'm guessing that this topic might have a response in you in one of four ways across the spectrum. On the one end, some of you are good at praying. You've grown in this, or maybe it comes a bit more naturally to you, and you love praying, and you're eager to consider it. Closer to the middle on that side are some of you who are not good at prayer, but you want to be. You hope to be, and you're eager to hear a message on prayer so that you can grow. Moving toward the other end, uh, some of you are not good, and you've given up hope, and you're a little bit discouraged already because you hear one more message on prayer that if anything like the past happens, you'll not put it into practice, even though you feel like you have the best of intentions. And then on the far end are those of you who may not be sure that prayer even matters. So, which one are you right now? And I imagine that all of us may be at different points at different times. So, just this morning, how do you come to this topic? Well, we're going to learn from Jesus about prayer this morning. Jesus' words speak to each one of us wherever we are, we are across that spectrum. And what Jesus teaches us is not complicated here. And it is powerful. And it can change how every one of us prays. And the reason Jesus' teaching is powerful is because He doesn't just focus on tips and techniques. He doesn't give advice on, here's the posture you need in prayer. Here's the time that you need to pray. Here's the best length of time that you should pray. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, he focuses on three essentials to lead a flourishing life of prayer. He teaches us to know what to pray for, who we pray to, and what we can expect. And so my hope is that as we look at this text together, this can move us into not just engaging with God in prayer or engaging with Him more, but enjoying God in prayer, and that this would continue to help us grow as a praying church. So let's read Luke chapter 11, the first 13 verses, and pray and then consider it together. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. Verse 5, and he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he would not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the, to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you? If his son asks for a fish, 
will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Well, let's pray and ask for that. Our Father, we come to You in the name of Jesus, and we are asking for You to do these very things in this next half hour or so with us. We pray that You would cause Your name to be hallowed and honored and regarded as holy among us in this time, and as a result of our time, more and more in our life. We pray that Your kingdom would come as we right now come under the rule of King Jesus, and that Your kingdom would spread through our lives. We pray that You would meet every need we have and forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. And we pray that You would cause Your Holy Spirit to do all these things and above and beyond anything we can ask or think today. And we pray in particular for those who are discouraged about how little they speak to You in prayer. We pray that You would give them fresh encouragement and transformation this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus is teaching us here three essentials for prayer. Know what to pray for, who we pray to, and what to expect. So first, let's just walk through this text together, and the first thing we see is know what to pray for. Now imagine that you could get a printout of all the prayers you prayed in 2023, this past year. And let's say that this printout, before it kind of spat out through the printer, it was categorized for you. And so all the prayers you pray are grouped together in categories. What are the main categories do you, that you think would show up for you? What are the top five things you pray for and you've prayed for most this past year? And not just the top five things you would aspire to pray for, but what do you think you actually prayed for most? Those are your priorities in prayer. No matter what you say or think, those are your priorities. What we see in the first four verses are the priorities that Jesus gives us for prayer. Now, we're not going to take time to write down our priorities, so that could be helpful, and then, you know, compare them with what Jesus says here. That may be pretty depressing anyway. So, here's what I say. Let's just start fresh. Let's just listen to Jesus, let Him set our priorities, and then move forward with these. So, He's giving us the categories that we should pray. So, this is what we call the Lord's Prayer. We see five priorities here. First, follow, Father, hallowed be Your name. Now, that may sound a bit archaic now. We don't use the word hallowed anymore except when referring to the Lord's Prayer. And we could get the wrong idea about this prayer. This is not an expression of praise. I used to think that this was a, say, a way of saying, God, Your name is hallowed. Have you thought that before? This is actually a request. So, what's the request? Well, we first have to understand what God's name refers to. So, in Jewish thought here, someone's name refers to their identity. It represents a person's character and reputation. So, this is a request for God's name, for God to be hallowed. So, what does it mean for Him to be hallowed? It means for God to be regarded as holy. You could translate this, Father, cause your name to be sanctified, or cause your name to be regarded as holy. Cause people to honor you. And this is a request. So, this is calling on God to do something in real space and time history in people's lives. It's asking God to work in our hearts and other people's hearts so that they would love Him, value Him, honor Him, be in awe of Him, regard Him as holy. And there's this very specific Old Testament text that is the backdrop to this request. It's the New Covenant promises of Ezekiel 36. So, in Ezekiel, God is speaking to Israel after He's sent them out of the land of Israel to among the nations in exile. 
But when they left the land, their hearts in it didn't change. They still despised God. They still didn't honor God. They lived lives that were not in step with God's values and ethics. And so people saw that God's own people despised him. And so what they did is they were functionally dragging God's name through the dirt. And so God even said in Ezekiel 36, you've profaned my name among the nations where I've sent you. And then God said that he had concern for his name. And so he promised that he would act to reverse the situation. One day, he would restore his people and create a people. He'd give them new hearts. He would give them the Holy Spirit. And the result would be that his people would honor his name. His people would live in such a way that God's name would not be profaned among the nations, but it would be regarded as holy. He would be hallowed. So Jesus is saying to you and me, to his disciples then, by extension all of us, pray for this. In your prayers, this should be, I mean, this is the first one. If anything's a priority, this is number one. Pray that God would work in such a way that he'd cause his name to be regarded as holy. So this is the first priority in prayer. Second, your kingdom come. It's the kingdom of God. That's his reign and his rule as it's come into the world through Jesus. Jesus is the king right now enthroned, and he is reigning, and his kingdom spreads as people like you and me come under his grace and authority, his good rule. And so, the kingdom of God is not equated with heaven. So, it's the, Jesus' rule has broken into the world already. So, we pray for God's kingdom to spread more and more, to come more, to spread further. And so, we also do look ahead to the second coming when God's kingdom will come through Jesus in its fullness. But this is not just a prayer for the return of Jesus. This is a prayer for this afternoon for God's rule to spread more and more in the world. So, what does it look like to pray these first two requests? Let's just pause here a second. Here's some ideas. First of all, pray for your own heart and life. Pray that God would change you and your heart to honor His name, that God would cause you to love Jesus and bring every part of your life, every moment of your day, under His good rule. A psychologist named Jordan Peterson has become well-known over the past few years. No doubt most of you have heard of him. And one of his most well-known bits of advice is clean your room or make your bed. His point is that in a culture where everyone is so excited to change the world and transform the world, mainly by tweeting about problems, we need to start in our own life, right? Start literally by making your own bed. Take responsibility for your sphere of influence. There's some wisdom there, but we can go deeper than that because this is a prayer for God to clean our own hearts. We ask God to first transform our hearts to honor Him. But from here, we pray for opportunities to share Jesus with people, evangelistic opportunities. This is a prayer that people would come to know Jesus and come under His rule. We want our family members, children, parents, siblings to come to know Jesus, neighbors across the street, behind us, down the road, coworkers whom we work with and do Zoom calls with or go to the office with, friends. We want them to come to know Jesus. This is also a prayer for global missions. We want God to be worshipped among every people group as Jesus sent us to take the gospel to. And there are many people groups who don't yet know Jesus. And so we want God's name to be honored and His kingdom to spread. So this is a prayer for global missions. And we'll also continue to pray for these in our service together on Sundays. And we're going to start doing something else in line with this prayer that we did this morning, which is to pray for other local churches by name, like we did already in this service. So we're not just about our own church. We never have been. We're about God's kingdom spreading as people submit to Jesus and flourish in local churches. And so I know of at least three churches in the Indianapolis area that pray for our church by name, in their Sunday services from time to time. 
I was visiting a church just a few Sundays ago, and I met a couple of uh, members there. And when I said that I was from Zionsville Fellowship, one of them lit up and said, oh, we pray for you all the time. Isn't that amazing? I I don't even know this person. And he he prays for us with his church family on Sundays from time to time. So we're going to start doing that. Pray for other churches that we have relationships with or other churches who have pastors whom I have a relationship with. So those are some ideas for how we can pray in line with these first two prayers. Third priority, give us each day our daily bread. So bread was a staple at every meal. To pray for bread was to pray for food in general. So really the category here that Jesus is giving is to pray for God to meet your physical material needs. Of course, we get a job, we get money, we buy food, we prepare the food. Before all that, somebody grew it and produced it, shipped it, shelved it. But in all of this, we're recognizing that this comes through God's hand. It works through what theologians call His providence. God is working in all things, and He does this to meet our needs. So we ask Him to do this, and we're dependent on Him. And that's why it's fitting to ask Him every day to provide food for us even if it's already in the fridge. Then we thank Him for providing it at every meal because He's the one giving it. Fourth, forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us. We all need forgiveness. Some of us here have not yet come to the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Maybe you're in a season of exploring who Jesus is. Maybe you've been here for years, but you've not yet actually come with your heart to the God who made you, confessing your sins, receiving forgiveness. This is an opportunity, an invitation for you to do that. So pray this prayer. Ask Him for forgiveness. Become a Christian. And for those who are Christians who have received forgiveness, you and I still sin. There's a sense in which we need ongoing forgiveness. We need the grace of Jesus to continually to be applied to us. So Jesus is giving this prayer to those who already follow Him. This is not a prayer for salvation, kind of a one-time prayer request that Jesus is giving His people. This is a prayer for Christians who already live under His grace. We still sin. It puts a relational barrier between us, and so we confess, we repent, and we receive fresh forgiveness. So very practically, here's what you can do every day. End the day by asking God to forgive you for your sins from that day. If that's not already your practice, make that your practice as you lay your head down or with a spouse or as a family. Pray for forgiveness every day for the sins of that day. And confess them specifically and individually before Him. And ask for specific forgiveness for specific sins. And this is why we often also have a time of confession in our Sunday service. We do this most Sundays, either as part of a song, or we leave space for you to silently confess your sins to the Lord, or we, it's included in uh, the prayer that a member will lead with us, or lead us in. Finally, lead us not into temptation. To pray this is to admit that we are not strong enough to endure temptation on our own. We recognize that we can be overwhelmed by temptation, and so we ask God to help us avoid sin, resist sin, and fight sin. This would be a prayer to pray every morning. Lord, help me not sin against you. Do not lead me into temptation. I need you to protect me. And then at the end of the day, we thank Him for that provision, and we confess any sins in which we've in in ways in which we've failed. So how do we take this and put it into practice in addition to the ways I've mentioned? Well, I think the most obvious answer is to use this prayer as a framework for prayer. That's what Martin Luther did. So he used this as a framework for prayer every day. He recited it out loud. He just recited the Lord's Prayer. And then he would go back through it one request at a time. So he would repeat then the first request And then he would just pray in light of that request. It became a category heading for whatever came to his mind 
to pray, either to thank God for, to praise Him for something, or to ask Him for something in light of it. And then he would move to the next request. And he said that sometimes he'd spend a lot of time on the first couple requests, and then he wouldn't get to the others. Other times he'd spend more time on some requests, less time on others. But the point was, he's just walking through the Lord's Prayer and letting that be the framework for his prayer. And so, if you want to read out how he did this, you can just look this up online. It's in what's called a letter to a barber. So, he wrote lots of letters that have been collected, and this was one of his letters to a barber, and he's giving advice on how to pray, and he explains how he uses the Lord's Prayer as a framework. So, I encourage you, write the Lord's Prayer down on a note card. Use each request as a heading for your own prayers. Use these five priorities as five categories for your prayers. Maybe you're younger, Any kids in here? Maybe you feel like you don't know how to pray. Well, you can open your Bible to Luke 11 and pray this prayer out loud. And then pray each line, and whatever comes to your mind, use that as prayers to God. Just pray what comes to your mind. Jesus said too, God's happy to hear you. This isn't that complicated. You can pray. And if you're ever leading prayer in our service from up front here. Consider using this as a framework for your prayer. So, this is the first essential of prayer that Jesus gives us. Know what to pray for. Again, not complicated. He's giving it right here. You want to know how to pray? Here's five categories. Pray these things. Second, know who you pray to. Okay, that should be obvious. But what Jesus is doing here is actually profound. After giving these priorities in prayer, he doesn't stop his instruction. Instead, he starts teaching his disciples what God is like. So, if you want to flourish in prayer, you have to know God's character. And what is he like? Well, in verses 5 through 8, Jesus shows us that God is like a faithful friend. So, he tells a story to make the point. It's kind of a funny story. So, the situation is verse 5. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Now, that would be especially strange in our culture, right? If someone comes over to your house at midnight, uh, and they didn't call, but they just kind of knock on the door, and they, they know you're already in bed, lights are out, and they're like, I need a loaf of bread. That would be very odd. Uh, In that culture, it wouldn't have been odd, though. People sometimes traveled at night since it was scorching hot during the day. And they didn't have phones, of course, to call ahead to let someone know they were coming. I saw a picture online yesterday of um, uh, like a teenage girl taking a picture with her iPhone of a payphone. And the heading was something like, you know, modern person takes pictures of ancient, you know, (laughs) landmark or something like this, artifact. Um, So, obviously, back then, no phones, no calling ahead of time. You just show up to get arrived unexpectedly, and the guy who needs to host them has no bread. And that would be a big deal in that culture, not to be able to provide anything for a visitor. So, he goes to his neighbor friend's house in the middle of the night to ask for bread. And how does this guy respond? He says in verse 7, don't bother me. The door's already shut. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. He's probably whispering this. So, this is probably a poorer community. The houses are close together here. It's a one-bedroom home. Everyone slept on a mat on the ground, which is why the kids are in bed with him in that sense. And he says, I'm not going to help. But then he changes his mind. Why? Verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him what he needs. Now, that word, impudence, could mean something like persistence, and that means that the man gets up because his friend who came is persistent. Um, that's possible. I think a more likely interpretation is that the word, the word means something like shamelessness or desire to be without shame, and it's referring to the guy inside the house, his desire to be without shame. So, Jesus is saying, that guy won't just help because his friend came, but he will come because of his desire to be without shame. So, that culture really valued honor, and if you don't help a friend provide hospitality, you would be shamed in that community. So, this man wants to avoid that, so he gets up and helps. And Jesus is saying, even if that bum friend won't get up 
to help his friend because he's his friend, he'll get up at least because he wants to be honorable. Jesus is saying, how much more will God, who is a true friend and honorable, help you? So the point is verse 9, ask, seek, knock, because God will swing the door open for you. So Jesus is making one big key assumption here in this story. Why is he telling this story? It's to motivate you and I to prayer. Do you see the assumption here? It's that how you view God will determine how you pray. If you have a prayer issue, it may be because you have a view of God issue. How we view God will either help or harm our prayer life. So here's what I mean. A lot of people view God as relatively aloof. Some call this view of God moralistic, therapeutic deism. God is there, but he's like this friend who doesn't really want to be bothered. He likes you, but he's probably not going to help you much. I struck up a conversation with a 16-year-old uh, sitting on a bench outside of where I was living one time, and we started talking. I was hoping to be able to talk to him about Jesus, and so I had asked him something about his spiritual background, and as we talked, I eventually asked him, what do you think God is like? And he said, I think God is chill. And so, it was an interesting answer, so I asked, okay, how does he view us? And he said, he wants us to be nice and good. We ended up having a good conversation after that, but here's my point. If that's how you view God, what will your prayers be like? And now, I don't think most of us would answer the question, what's God like? Oh, I think God's chill. We would say something like that. You may, have, you may have read theology books, I hope you have, and have a big view of God. But functionally, when you think of Him in relation to you personally and your needs, do you think He cares? Do you think He's eager to spread His blessing? Here's my point. If that's how you view God, your prayers will not be big, and they won't be often, and you certainly won't go to Him in tragedy. But God isn't aloof. He's a faithful friend to His people, and He's eager and willing to respond. So Jesus teaches us then, know what to pray for, know who to pray to, and finally know what to expect. If you ask for the things that He's called us to ask for here, and you ask this kind of generous God, what can you expect? In verses 9 to 13, Jesus starts to emphasize the answer. And his point is that God is our Father who gives us good things. He says to the fathers among us, which one of you, if your son asks you for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Now, I'm a fan of practical jokes, not against me, but just in general, watching on YouTube and hearing about things that happen to you. Uh, and dads are often really good at these. And of course, the dad joke dads here love to give someone or kids exactly what they literally ask for. But we all know if your son really needs something, you'll give him what he needs. And notice how Jesus makes his point in verse 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So he's talking to generous dads, good generous dads. And he says, if you then, who are evil, so he's talking to good fathers, and he just slips in there that they are evil. I remember how Ray Ortland referenced this verse one time and just made this observation, which is right, about human nature, according to Jesus. Apparently, according to Jesus, we are all nice, evil people. <laughs> and if nice, evil people like us can give good gifts, how much more does God know how to give good gifts? And what does God give? Well, Jesus does not say what I think we would expect him to say. If we didn't know how this verse ended, and it's kind of fill in the blank, I think we'd expect him to say, hey, if fathers know how to give good gifts, your heavenly father knows how to give good gifts. Or you may say great gifts. Or you may say the best gifts. What did Jesus say, though? He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. How surprising. Why did he say that? What does it mean? Well, this is connecting back again to the promises of Ezekiel 36. The Old Testament promised that one day God would cause his name to be honored. He would bring his kingdom. 
He would bring full and final forgiveness of sins. And tied to all of that was the great gift of the Holy Spirit. He would send the Holy Spirit to indwell His people, to transform our hearts and lives. Those are the things that Jesus has just said to pray for. And now He says, ask God for those things. Make those requests. There's no greater priorities you can have, and God will answer. He will give the best gift. He will send the Holy Spirit to answer these kinds of prayers, these kinds of requests. When you pray according to these priorities, the only answer that can come is if the Holy Spirit is sent to fulfill them, to transform people's hearts, to spread the rule of King Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you can expect it, even those kinds of big prayers. And Jesus did send the Spirit. After His death and resurrection, He told His disciples, wait for the Holy Spirit, and they prayed, and then Acts 2 shows that the Spirit came, and the Spirit advances the kingdom through His people, changing our hearts, spreading the gospel as we speak about Jesus in the world. He dwells among us, and so now we ask for more of His influence. So that's what we can expect. We can expect that He will influence the world in answer to our prayers, and this will influence how we pray if we believe it. Jesus is teaching this because we need to know this if we're going to flourish in prayer. If you don't believe that God is eager to answer your prayers, then you won't go to Him. God is certainly a better Father than I am. My boys have learned that it's not even worth asking me for certain things. So they go to mom instead, and she says, why aren't you asking dad? And they say, because he'll say no. And they're not wrong. They don't even bother, and sometimes they can tell I'm in a mood where I'm going to say no to anything. Sometimes I just say no, then a few seconds later, I'm like, that was really unreasonable. Never mind. Of course you can do that. Um, Now, I want to be mainly a yes dad. I believe that, and that's for another message. But I hope to say no when I do for good reasons. But sometimes I say no because I'm selfish. And yes will inconvenience me, but God is not like me. I'm a good, evil person. I'm a nice, evil dad, according to Jesus, and so are you, fathers, even the best of us. God alone is good, and we can go to Him and trust Him. So you can expect good things from Him. You can expect the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Drew, but what about when God doesn't answer? Doesn't that kind of contradict this picture of God that Jesus gives us? And I would say, God doesn't promise here to give us everything we want when we want it. But He does promise to give us what is best and when He knows is best. He will give the Holy Spirit to accomplish the Spirit's work in the world. You may long for healing and need healing, and He may heal you by the Holy Spirit now or on this side of death, but you may need to wait till the resurrection, and that's still a legit good answer to prayer. So let's pray in light of this. Use these priorities as a framework. Learn to see God as a true friend and faithful Father. Learn to expect His generosity. So as we close here, I just want to encourage you to pray. Pray individually and pray together. He invites us to pray together here. Do you see this? Notice that the request that Jesus gave her in the plural, give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. So have this in mind when we pray together in church gatherings. There's a group of people who pray for the sermon and our service every week. I email them the sermon text to pray. So if you would commit to praying as well like this, email me. I'll put you on the list and you can pray the Lord's Prayer. These priorities for our time together here. And during our service, we pray together often through our Sunday mornings together. And no prayer is kind of a throwaway prayer just because like, well, you should probably pray at the the beginning. You should probably kind of wrap up with prayer. I mean, all of it is important. We pray at the welcome to ask God to do what only He can do during our service. A member often leads us in extended prayer about the priorities like we hear in the Lord's Prayer. We pray before we hear the sermon, asking God to speak so we can hear Him and be changed in light of it. We pray at the end of the sermon for God to change us in light of this as we go. And many of our songs throughout our service are prayers directed to God. So pray together also after the service. So come on Sundays with 
this in mind. And, and also an invitation to come to our churchwide prayer gathering, which is next Sunday at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. We pray at the beginning of the year for God to do what only He can do with us. Pray in small groups in encouragement to make sure you don't just share requests for prayer, but actually pray together. Pray as families at least one time every day. As long as you have other people living with you in the home, gather together to pray together. And fathers, I encourage you to take the lead here in leading your family in this way. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for this clear, hopeful, practical instruction on prayer. And we pray that you would let this be called to mind this week, that we would take steps to pray in light of these priorities as Jesus taught us. And we pray that you would continue to transform our minds and hearts to view you rightly, to not just view you rightly even just in our head, but in our hearts and in our guts, that we know that you are generous and you hear us and you love us and you are a generous Father. So we pray that you would lead us to pray these big prayers and that we would long to see you answer and that we'd praise you when you do. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.